All right, welcome back. This is session number four of the second day. How about that? We're on a roll here. This afternoon, we're not going to be able to finish uh, the lesser light. We're going to do everything possible to try and finish, but I rather doubt that we will be able to because we have to cover 20 pages. And from previous experience, many hundreds of presentations, I know that it's difficult to get through 12. <laughs> and so we are going to do the best we can, and we might have to revisit this subject tomorrow morning uh, when we come to the first session. But that's fine. Uh, we are in no hurry. We still have uh, three days to go, plus Sabbath, which is a partial day. Okay, we're going to begin on page 81, at the bottom of the page where it says, Introduction. During the last several years, I've had the privilege of preaching in several evangelistic meetings at my church here uh, in Fresno, Fresno Central Church. Having been the pastor there for the better part of 19 years, you can't always preach the same series of evangelistic sermons because you usually have much of the same audience. And so after doing a series on Genesis and after doing a series on the Three Angels message, I decided to do a series trying to present all of the Adventist message from the four Gospels and the book of Acts. And the name of that series was What Jesus Said. And I might say that this is one of the series that we have in the docket for the future here in our studio at Secrets Unsealed. Because there are many Christians who say, well, I'm a New Testament Christian. And there are some that say, you know, I am only a Gospels Christian and up to, up to Acts 2 verse 38. That's the Church of Christ. So uh, if you can prove all of the Adventist doctrines from the four Gospels and the book of Acts, uh, you know, you're taking that card away from them that, uh, you know, you have to uh, go by what the Gospels and the book of Acts have to say. And so I decided that I would do this series, What Jesus Said, presenting the full Adventist message from the four Gospels and from the book of Acts. Actually, as I did my research, it was very easy to find all of the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Gospels and the book of Acts. It was a piece of cake. But there was one doctrine that... I kept on struggling with, and that was the gift of prophecy. I kept on thinking, and I kept on coming up with a dead end. Not that the Gospels and the book of Acts doesn't mention the gift of prophecy. Uh, those books mention the gift of prophecy many, many times. But I wanted to present the gift of prophecy in the context of the end time, the gift as it is given to the remnant church. So I struggled with this for several weeks, uh, thinking and reflecting and doing research and rereading the Gospels and the book of Acts. And one day I was sitting there uh, at my desk at the church and uh, meditating and thinking about this and praying and asked the Lord to show me how I should make this specific presentation when suddenly like a flash of lightning across my mind, uh, I, you know, I don't believe a lot in voices. I don't think that I can say that I've heard the audible voice of God. But it was almost like I heard a voice saying to me, study the life, message, and mission of John the Baptist, and you will find the message that you need to present during this series. So I went to Strong's Concordance, and I looked up every reference to John the Baptist. And what I'm going to share with you is the fruit of the research that I did after deciding to study the life of John the Baptist. So what we're going to do first is we're going to take a look at the life and mission and message of John the Baptist. And then in the second part of our study, we are going to take a look at the life, the message, and the mission of Ellen White. And we're going to see a striking parallel between the, uh, John the Baptist and Ellen White. There are many, many striking parallels. Now let's begin by talking about the great Advent revival that took place slightly before Jesus began His ministry, actually a few months before He began His ministry. It was the spring and summer of the year 27 A.D., and momentous events were taking place in and around Jerusalem. A great religious revival was taking place among God's people. 
they were aware of the fact that the prophecy of the 70 weeks was about to come to an end, at least the prophecy of the first eight, 483 years. Obviously they knew when the decree had been given to restore and build Jerusalem. And so they knew that the last week of the 70 weeks was about to begin, and there was great expectancy. Multitudes flocked to the wilderness or to the desert to John the Baptist to be baptized, and they confessed their sins, and they repented of sin, and they requested that John the Baptist baptize them in the River Jordan. We find a description of this revival in Matthew chapter 3 and verses 5 and 6. It reads there, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him, that is to John, and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Notice this is a, a large revival, because we're told Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan goes out to the desert to where John is preaching. There can be little doubt that one reason for the excitement was that the final week of the 70 weeks, like I mentioned before, was about to begin. Furthermore, we must remember that the Old Testament ended in expectancy. The Old Testament ended by saying that they should expect Elijah before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. In other words, before the coming of the Messiah, Elijah would come. And John the Baptist seemed to fit the description of that Elijah. He lived in the desert like Elijah. He ate what Elijah ate. He was clothed like Elijah. He called the people to repentance, as did Elijah. And so everybody said, this must be the precursor. This must be the forerunner of the Messiah because he is just like Elijah. And the Old Testament promised the coming of Elijah before the coming of the Messiah. Now Jesus alluded to the prophecy of the 70 weeks when he began his ministry. Notice Mark chapter 1 and verse 15 where we are told that Jesus said, The time is fulfilled. What did Jesus mean when He said the time is fulfilled? What time was He referring to? He was referring to the prophecy of the 70 weeks. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The reason why Jesus stated that the time was fulfilled is because His anointing at His baptism had just taken place in harmony with the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And the kingdom of God was at hand because Jesus had just at this moment with His baptism begun His public ministry or He was about to begin His public ministry in the synagogue in Nazareth. Now let's say a few things about John the Baptist, the forerunner, the one that was supposed to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, the first coming of the Messiah. John the Baptist was a humble and modest man. He did not seek to attract attention to himself. His main function was to give testimony to Jesus. When the Jews sent the priests and the Levites to ask John the Baptist if he was the Christ or even if he was Elijah the prophet, John the Baptist responded, and this is in John 1 verses 19 to 21, I am not. Notably, although John stated that he was not Elijah and he was not the prophet, Jesus identified him as the greatest of the prophets and also called him Elijah, interestingly enough. The fact is that John did not claim to be a prophet. He was humble and he was modest. He did not seek the call to be a prophet. So the question is, if John the Baptist was not the prophet, then who was John the Baptist? Well, in Luke chapter 7 and verse 27, we find the answer to that question, which is really a quotation that comes from Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. There in Luke 7 and verse 27, uh, the words that were written over 400 years before are now going to be quoted 
and applied to John the Baptist. And notice the name that is given to John the Baptist. It says, This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my what? Don't forget all these details. We're going to come back to them. I send my messenger before your face who will what? Prepare your way before you. So he's not the prophet, but he is the messenger of the Lord. This is the title of John the Baptist. He is the messenger. Now another interesting detail about John the Baptist is that he was not only a prophet, he was actually more than a prophet. Notice Luke chapter 7 and verse 26. Here Jesus is speaking about John the Baptist. And he says, But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. So John the Baptist says, I'm not the prophet. His name is the messenger of the Lord. And we find here that Jesus states that John was greater than a prophet. His work was greater than that of a common prophet. In Matthew 11 and verse 11, we also find the same idea. Assuredly, I say to you, here Jesus is speaking, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. By the way, one of the books that you were supposed to read or uh, that you should read for this class is The Greatest of the Prophets. And I hope that you'll read that book because that book describes some sad things that are happening within the Seventh-day Adventist Church when it comes to the gift of prophecy. In Desire of Ages, page 220, Ellen White had this to say about the work of John the Baptist. Aside from the joy that John found in his mission, his life has, had been one of sorrow. His voice had been seldom heard except in the wilderness. His was a lonely lot, and he was not permitted to see the result of his own labors. It was not his privilege to be with Christ and witness the manifestation of divine power attending the greater light. Who is the greater light here? Jesus. Very well. That's important to remember. It was not for him to see the blind restored to sight, the sick healed, and the dead raised to life. He did not behold the light that shone through every word of Christ, shedding glory upon the promises of prophecy. The least disciple who saw Christ's mighty works and heard His words was in this sense more highly privileged than John the Baptist and therefore is said to have been greater than he. So Jesus says He's the greatest of the prophets, but He also said there, is, there are others, He is the least of all, and others are greater than He. And Ellen White explains the apparent discrepancy between those two ideas. In another place she explains that what made John the greatest of the prophets was the fact that he was the bridge between two dispensations. He was the bridge between the Old Dispensation, the Old Testament period, and the New Testament period. He had the privilege of bridging both of those periods. Another interesting detail about John the Baptist is that he did not perform miracles and signs. You say, where does the Bible say that John the Baptist did not perform miracles and signs? Notice John chapter 10 and verses 41 and 42. Then many came to him and said to Jesus, John performed no sign. But all the things that John spoke about this man were true, and many believed in him there. So what was important about John the Baptist? Was it the signs and wonders, or was it the message that he presented? The message authenticated the gift of prophecy, not the signs and the wonders. John the Baptist had the testimony of Jesus. Notice John 5, verses 31 to 34. And I might remind you that the word witness in the New Testament is the same identical word, testimony. So we need to remember that when we read this passage. Here John says, uh, actually I think this is Jesus who says this, If I bear witness or testimony of myself, 
my testimony is not true. There is another who bears testimony of me, and I know that the testimony which he testifies of me is true. Well, who was Jesus speaking about? John the Baptist. You have sent to John, and he has borne testimony to the truth. Did you know the, notice the number of times that we're told that John the Baptist bore testimony to Jesus? Did John the Baptist have the testimony of Jesus Christ? Yes, his purpose was to point to Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting to notice that John was asked if he was the light, and he said no. John chapter 1 and verses 6 through 9. John 1 verses 6 through 9. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a testimony, to bear testimony of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness or testimony of that light. That was the true light that gives light to every man coming into the world. So what was the role of John the Baptist? It was to give witness or to give testimony concerning the what? Concerning the light. He wasn't the light, but he was going to give testimony to the light. But there's something very interesting. John the Baptist was a light. Say what? Absolutely. He was not the light. He was a light to point to the light. The lesser light to point to the greater light. Notice John chapter 5 and verses 35 and 36. Speaking about John, Jesus says, He was the burning and shining lamp. It's the word luchnos, which is a lamp, which is not the sun, by the way. It's not the greater light. It's a little lamp. He was the burning and shining lamp. And you were willing for a time to rejoice in His what? Light. Did John the Baptist have light? Yes. What kind of light? A lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. It continued. And now notice Jesus says, so that you see that Jesus is the greater light, but I have a greater witness than John's. Are you, are you catching the picture? So who is the lesser light? The lesser light is John. Who is the greater light? The greater light is Jesus Christ. So it says in verse 36, But I have a greater witness than John's, for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. But now there's something else that's very interesting. The Scriptures were also a lesser light. You say, what? We've heard that the Scriptures are the greater light and that the spirit of prophecy is the lesser light. When you examine it carefully, that's not the case. The Scriptures were also a lesser light. And you say, how's that? Let's continue here where it says the Scriptures a lesser light. No book can fully reveal Jesus Christ in all of His glory as He is in person. Would you agree with that? The Bible is merely a pale reflection of Jesus the person. The greater light is the sun and the lesser light is the moon. The light of the moon has the purpose of reflecting the light of the sun to the earth in the darkness of the night. Now let's notice that the scriptures are also a lesser light to lead to Jesus the greater light. Notice John chapter 5 and verse 39. Here Jesus is speaking. You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Do the Scriptures also testify of the greater light? Yes. Absolutely. So you have two lesser lights. You say, why do you need two lesser lights? For the same reason that you need Ellen White and the Bible, two lesser lights. We'll come back to that. Why two lesser lights? The question immediately suggests itself. Why did the people need a non-canonical source? Because John the Baptist was not a writing prophet. He doesn't have a book of the Bible. Why did the people need a non-canonical source if they had the written scriptures of the Old Testament? Or even further, why would they need a lesser light 
if the greater light would be in their midst immediately after John the Baptist? Are you understanding the question? The answer is quite simple. During the period between the Testaments, the people had fallen into gross darkness and had gone astray because of a neglect and a misinterpretation of the written scriptures. All kinds of false teachings and practices came in during this period, and therefore they needed a lesser light to point the people to the greater light through the scriptures. In other words, the purpose of John was to shine upon the pages of the scriptures so that they could see Jesus there. Are you understanding me? Let's read about the darkness that existed during this period. Isaiah 60 verses 1 and 2 when Jesus came. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and His glory will be seen upon you. This is a messianic prophecy. It's saying that the people were going to be in darkness, and the greater light was going to come to shed light. We find in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 16 the following words, The people who sat in darkness have seen what? A great light, speaking about Jesus. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. If I enter a dark room where I have never been before, I need to find the light switch, right? It would help if I had a lesser light or a flashlight to lead me to the light switch to turn on the greater light. Now, John the Baptist did not bring any new light. The role of John was not to bring new light, but rather to turn the attention of the people to the light already given. And what light would that be, the light already given? The written scriptures, the written scriptures. He was to awaken interest, amplify and explain Old Testament prophecy. That is to say, the role of John was not supplementary, but rather what? Complementary to Scripture. You see, those who claimed to be God's people and boasted of having the written Scriptures of the Old Testament were violating every principle of the Word of God. They professed to be waiting for the Messiah. They professed to love God. They claimed to have a close relationship with Him and yet they ended up crucifying their Messiah because they misunderstood the written scriptures of the Old Testament and rejected the clarifying light given by the lesser light, John the Baptist. Are you starting to catch the picture here? Because they rejected the lesser light, John, they ended up rejecting what? The greater light, Jesus Christ. You can just imagine the people uh, boasting, we have Moses. And yet they did not understand or practice his teachings. They boasted of their knowledge of the scriptures, and yet they did not understand or obey them. The role of John was to attract attention of the people to the scriptures already given. In other words, he was a lesser light to shine on the other lesser light so that everybody could see the greater light. Now, John 5, verses 39 and 45 to 47, once again we find that the Scriptures are a lesser light. It says there, here Jesus is speaking to the Jews, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. So are the Scriptures a lesser light that lead to Jesus, the greater light? Do they give testimony to Jesus? Absolutely. Then Jesus says, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, that's the written scriptures, correct? For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So the scriptures are a lesser light to lead to Jesus, the greater light. 
and John the Baptist is a lesser light to shine on the pages of Scripture so that the people in the Scriptures can see Jesus the greater light. I am of a firm belief that if the Jews had understood and obeyed the writings of Moses, God would never have called John the Baptist. John drew attention to the Old Testament prophecies that pointed to the Messiah. He pointed out Jesus as the Lamb of God, a clear reference to the sanctuary service and to Isaiah 53. Was that new light that John the Baptist brought when he said, Behold the Lamb of God? Absolutely not. He took from the Old Testament and showed how it was being fulfilled in Jesus. He exalted the Old Testament and made it vivid and alive. He expanded, rebuked, reproved, corrected, but he did not add anything of substance. Even baptism was known in the days of John. Certainly the Jews knew that in the sanctuary water was used for cleansing. They knew about the story of Naaman. They knew that leprosy was a symbol of sin and that Naaman had been cleansed by submerging himself in the Jordan River seven times. The Apostle Paul even writes that the children of Israel were baptized in the Red Sea. So baptism was not even a new revolutionary doctrine or concept that was unknown among the Jews. Now John the Baptist was a fly in the ointment, a pain in the neck, a speck in the eye. He was no pushover. <laughs> he was not politically correct, but told it like it is. He rebuked sin fearlessly and played no favorites. And of course, this won him what? Enemies. He was not liked. This lesser light was not liked. The lesser light to shine on the pages of the other lesser light so that people could see the greater light, Jesus. They didn't like it. In Matthew 11, verses 7 and 8, we find that John rebuked Herod to his face for committing adultery with his brother's wife and lost his head as a result. John was totally unafraid of speaking the truth. And we're going to find that Ellen White was fearless in speaking the truth. And she did not spare anyone. She spoke to the greatest leaders of the church. She did not uh, play this political correctness game. She told it like it was. She rebuked sin openly and clearly. I want you to notice what it says in Matthew 11, 7 and 8 about the type of person that John the Baptist was. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? In other words, a little pushover, you know, a reed when the wind blows, the reed goes this way and that. Is that what you expected to see? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. John the Baptist was a restorer and a preparer of the way for the first coming of Christ. The role of John was to prepare a people for the first coming of Jesus. By repentance, revival, and reformation, the people were to wait expectantly for the bridegroom. Is that the role of Ellen White, by the way? Absolutely. He simply called, he didn't bring any new truths. He simply called Israel to repent and return to the religion of the fathers. This is why Elijah built the altar of the Lord. He also called upon the God of the covenant founders, and he called the children to return to the fathers. Elijah did that. And John the Baptist is in the New Testament what? Elijah, not in person, but in the spirit and power of Elijah with the same message. I want you to notice three passages now that speak about John as the great restorer and the preparer of the way for the Messiah. Luke 1, verses 16 and 17. Speaking about the mission of John, it says, He will turn many of the children Israel, of Israel to the Lord their God. Are you catching the picture here? What is the role of John? Is the role of John primarily to reach out the worldlings and bring them to the Lord? No, it's to bring the children of God, Israel, back to the Lord. 
So it says, And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go, go before him. In other words, John the Baptist would go before Jesus in the spirit, spirit and power of whom? Of Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and notice, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So what was the role of John the Baptist? The role of John the Baptist was to bring God's people back to the foundation so that when the Messiah would come, they would be ready. Notice Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What was the kingdom of heaven that was at hand? Jesus and His ministry. Verse 3, For this is He who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make His paths straight. So once again, John the Baptist doesn't bring any new truth. It's to lead the people back to the foundational truths so that they would be ready to receive the Messiah. Notice Matthew chapter 17 and verse 11. Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first, and he will innovate all things. Oh, thank you. I need to get some new glasses here. It says, He will what? Restore all things. What does it mean to restore? Does it mean to bring new truths, something that has never been heard before? No, it means to restore that which has been forgotten and forsaken and is not being practiced. So John the Baptist was the great restorer like all of the prophets before him that led people to come back to the foundational truths that we find in the writings of Moses. In New Testament times, the friend of the bridegroom was responsible for making all the preparations for the wedding so that all was ready when the groom should come. The friend of the bridegroom was not to take any glory for himself. The glory was for the groom who was to marry the bride. The best man in the wedding is not the center of attraction. The friend of the bridegroom decreases so that the groom can increase. And who was the groom that wanted to marry his people? Jesus Christ. And who was the matchmaker? <laughs> John the Baptist was supposed to prepare everything for the wedding. The Old Testament contained prophecies about the bridegroom coming to marry his bride. The matchmaker, John the Baptist, had come to make all the arrangements for the wedding, but the bride rejected the invitation. By rejecting, listen carefully, the preparatory work of the matchmaker, they rejected the bridegroom as well. The very people he came to serve mistreated John the Baptist. Are you starting to catch the interesting picture here? Now, John the Baptist was despised and rejected. I want to read three texts that describe how John the Baptist was looked upon and how he was treated. Matthew 11, verse 18, they went a long ways, the people at that time. They came close to committing the unpardonable sin. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. They attributed his prophecy, gift, as being inspired by the devil. And some people have said that concerning Ellen White. I might say. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 32, it says, For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not what? Believe in him. But tax collectors and harlots believed in him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe in him. And so if they did not believe in the message of John the Baptist, would they believe in Jesus? Would they believe in the message of the Scriptures if they did not believe in John the Baptist? No. By rejecting John the Baptist, they were rejecting the Scriptures and they rejected Jesus, the greater light. And who was particularly to blame? The scholars and the church leaders. Notice Luke chapter 7, verses 29 and 30. And when all the people heard Him, the problem wasn't with the people, when all the people heard Him, 
Even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees, that would be the preachers, and lawyers, those are the theologians, rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by Him. The religious leaders knew Him not. They did with John as they pleased, and therefore they treated Jesus in the same way. And these were the people, the very people, who claimed to understand and teach the Scriptures. By rejecting the lesser light, they rejected the greater light. Matthew chapter 17, verses 12 and 13 adds its testimony about how John the Baptist was treated and how the rejection of John led to the rejection of Jesus. It says there in John, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 12, Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. And how did they react? And they did not know him. That's another expression that means that they rejected Him. It's not talking about not knowing intellectually. It means not accepting. So notice, once again, it says uh, in, let's see here, yeah, verse uh, 13, verse 12 and verse 13, But I say to you, Elijah has already come. They did not know Him, and notice, but did to Him what? Whatever they pleased or whatever they wished. And now notice the result. Likewise, because they did with Him what they wished, likewise the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that He spoke to them of whom? John the Baptist. The people to whom prophets are sent never love true prophets. In fact, those who profess to be God's chosen people hated the prophets. Before the Babylonian captivity, we find these words in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verses 15 and 16. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warning to, warnings to them by His messengers, rising up early and sending them, because He had compassion on His people and on His dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised His words, and scoffed at His prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against His people, till there was no remedy. The rejection of the gift of prophecy led to the rejection of the people. Jesus rebuked the scribes and Pharisees. In Matthew 23 and verse 37, we find these words of Jesus, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Could we say that the same type of thing is happening to God's messenger in these last days? There is no doubt whatsoever, folks. Maybe you're encapsulated in your own local church. I have the privilege of traveling all over the world. It is alarming to see how the spirit of prophecy is ignored and in many circles attacked and tried to explain away what Ellen White has to say. Now, John the Baptist was not omniscient. He was not infallible. He was a weak human instrument. Prophets are not omniscient and infallible. They were always weak human beings in need of the grace of God. And here comes an important point. Prophets grew in their understanding of truth. At first they might not have fully understood the message of God. But as time goes by, things become clearer and clearer in their minds. John the Baptist did not fully understand the kingdom at the beginning of his ministry. He believed that there would be only one coming of the Messiah. Notice Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, where we find these words. His winnowing fan is in his hand. Here John is announcing the work of Jesus. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he, that is the coming Messiah, 
will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. <laughs> Does that sound like he believed in the coming of a Messiah who was going to say, love your enemies, turn the other cheek, carry this load two miles if they ask you to take it one? It sure doesn't sound like it. John the Baptist did not understand fully, even though he was a true prophet, at the beginning of his ministry, he did not fully understand. As time goes by, things become clearer to him. Let's read a few statements from Ellen White where Ellen White makes this very, very clear. You know, sometimes we expect too much from a prophet. Ellen White said some things at the very beginning of her ministry that as time goes by, she clarifies and she amplifies and she explains things that might be misunderstood, now she presents it in a way in which it cannot be misunderstood. But some people take only what she said at the beginning of her ministry, they don't take the trajectory, the fuller understanding, they say, oh, Ellen White was wrong, look what she said when she was 17 years old. That's not fair, because prophets grow in their understanding. Notice this statement from Desire of Ages, page 103. John did not fully understand the nature of Messiah's kingdom. He looked for Israel to be delivered from her national foes. But the coming of a king in righteousness and the establishment of Israel as a holy nation was the great object of his hope. He thought that the Messiah was going to take over the throne of the kingdom. Notice Desire of Ages, page 136. During the weeks that followed, that is the baptism of Jesus, John with new interest studied the prophecies and the teaching of the sacrificial service. See, he's trying to understand the type of Messiah that has just come. She continues saying, He did not distinguish clearly the two phases of Christ's work as a suffering sacrifice and a conquering king, but he saw that his coming had a deeper significance than the priest or the people had discerned. Was he less of a prophet because he did not fully understand? He was still a full-fledged prophet, but he was not omniscient. He was not absolutely infallible. We have to look at the total trajectory of his ministry. Are you following me or not? This is important to understand Ellen White. When Jesus did not appear to measure up to his expectations, John sent a message to Jesus asking him if he was the expected Messiah or they were to wait for another. Imagine that. This is that John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now he sends a message, Are you the Messiah that we're expecting? He was human. He was not omniscient. He was not infallible. He grew in his understanding. Was John a false prophet because he did not fully understand the work of the Messiah? No. Was his work as a prophet any less trustworthy because his knowledge and understanding were, limit, understanding were limited because of his own misconceptions? No. Notably, when the disciples of John, this is important, brought back the report from the lips of Jesus, in fact, uh, they, they did more than bring the report from the lips of Jesus. Actually, uh, Jesus told the disciples of John to stick around. He said, stick around and see what I'm going to do today. So they stayed all day. Jesus opened the eyes of the blind. He healed par paralytics. He raised the people from the dead. And then at the end of the day, he said to the disciples of John, now you go tell John what you saw. And John, finally in prison, remembered Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah that he would open up the eyes of the blind and he would heal the lame and so on. He said, this is the Messiah. So, he finally came to understand at the end of his ministry. Now we need to go to the other prophet. We have about 13 and a half minutes left, but let's take advantage of, the, of that time because there's a lot of material to cover. Ellen White was accused of not having the prophetic gift because she did not perform miracles. Interesting. Did John perform miracles? No. Notice, this is found in Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 53 and 54. Some declare their unbelief in the work that the Lord has given me to do because, as they say, Mrs. E.G. White works no miracles. 
but those who look for miracles as a sign of divine guidance are in grave danger of deception. So what do you need to look at the fact that Ellen White performed many miracles or what she wrote was true? What she wrote was true. It's interesting to notice that Ellen White preferred not to be called a prophet. Remember John the Baptist? Are you the prophet? No, no, I'm not the prophet. Notice this statement that we find in Selected Messages, Volume 1, pages 35 and 36. Ellen White has given a discourse at the Battle Creek Tabernacle in Michigan, and this is what she states. During the discourse, I said that I did not claim to be a prophetess. Some were surprised at this statement, and as much is being said in regard to it, I will make an explanation. Others have called me a prophetess, but I have never assumed that title. Is that true of John the Baptist as well? Yes. Absolutely. I have not felt that it was my duty thus to designate myself. Those who boldly assume that they are prophets in this our day are often a reproach to the cause of Christ. In the same book, Selected Messages, volume 1, page 35, we find this statement. When I was last in Battle Creek, I said before a large congregation that I did not claim to be a prophetess. Twice I referred to this matter, intending each time to make the statement, I do not claim to be a prophetess. If I spoke otherwise than this, let all now understand that what I had in mind to say was that I do not claim the title of prophet or prophetess, because Ellen White was humble and because prophets had a bad name in those days. So if Ellen White did not claim to be a prophet, who was she? Well, she preferred to be called the messenger of the Lord, by coincidence of coincidences. <laughs> it's not a coincidence. Select the messages, volume 1, page 32. Early in my youth I was asked several times, Are you a prophet? I have ever responded, I am what? The Lord's messenger. I know that many have called me a prophet, but I have made no claim to this title. My Savior declared me to be His messenger, just like John the Baptist. On page 32 she continues saying, I have had no claims to make, only that I am instructed that I am the Lord's messenger, that He called me in my youth to be His messenger, to receive His word, and to give a clear and decided message in the name of the Lord Jesus. One further statement, Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 34, To claim to be a prophetess is something that I have never done. If others call me by that name, I have no controversy with them. But my work has covered so many lines that I cannot call myself other than a messenger sent to bear a message from the Lord to His people and to take up work in any line that He points out. So she says, I don't claim to be a prophet, but she is the messenger of the Lord, and she did not perform any miracle. But Ellen White was more than a prophet. Let's read these interesting statements in Selected Messages, Volume 1. Page 37, Ellen White stated this, My work includes what? Much more than this name, prophetess, signifies. Was John more than a prophet? Yes. Ellen White says, My work is more than the work of a common prophet. I regard myself as a messenger, entrusted by the Lord with messages for His people. My commission embraces the work of a prophet, but it does not end there. It embraces much more than the minds of those who have been sowing the seeds of unbelief can comprehend. Page 32, she says, Why have I not claimed to be a prophet? Because in these days many who boldly claim that they are prophets are a reproach to the cause of Christ, and because my work includes, listen now, much more than the word prophet signifies. Was John more than a prophet? Was Ellen White more than a prophet? Absolutely. One final quotation, this should be page 34, you can delete the 93 there. I have a problem with my Apple computer, it scrolls and scrolls and scrolls, so I have to eliminate bunches of numbers and sometimes it falls to the cracks. So it's Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 34. To claim to be a prophetess is something that I have never done. If others call me by that name, I have no controversy with them, 
but now notice, but my work has covered what? So many lines that I cannot call myself other than a messenger sent to bear a message from the Lord to His people and to take up work in any line that He points out. In what sense was Ellen White more than a prophet? Look at the list that you find at the bottom of page 93. Did she address issues in the medical field? Yes. How about the educational field? How about the publishing field? How about the administration of the work? You know, these abbreviations, you have the medical work, Ministry of Healing, Councils on Health, Councils on diet and Diets and Foods, and Medical Ministry. Educational, education, fundamentals of Christian education, publishing, call Porter Ministry, administration of the work, testimonies to ministers, ministerial, gospel workers, evangelism, you have the compilation, the work the, of the book, evangelism, theology, the conflict series, home and marriage, the Adventist home, psychology, mind, character, and personality, devotional life, the desire of ages, children, child guidance, finances, councils on stewardship, health, ministry of healing, councils on health, councils on diet and foods. She was more than a prophet because she was to prepare a people in every sphere of life for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Her work was more than the work of a conventional prophet. She was more in the line of Moses, if you really look at her. And I'm in, the, in the present, I'm developing a sermon comparing Moses and Ellen White. There's a very interesting comparison uh, between them. Now let me ask you, did Ellen White have the testimony of Jesus Christ, just like John did? Of course. We've already read Revelation chapter 12, 17, chapter 19, verse 10, and chapter 22, verse 9, where it says that the remnant church would have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. And I'd like to just read this statement from Loma Linda Messages, page 33, where Ellen White discusses Revelation 12, 17, and she says this, This prophecy points out clearly that the remnant church will acknowledge God in His law, that is because they keep the commandments of God, and will have what? The prophetic gift. Obedience to the law of God and the spirit of prophecy has always distinguished the true people of God and the test is usually given on present manifestations. So, did Ellen White, like John, have the testimony of Jesus Christ? Most certainly, yes. Now we reach another very interesting point. Ellen White spoke of her writings as a lesser light. Notice what we find in volume 3 of Selected Messages, page 30. Little heed is given to the Bible. Is that true of the Jews in the days of Christ? Little heed was given to the Bible? So what did God do? God raised up John the Baptist to do what? To shine on the pages of the Bible so that people had a renewed understanding and they could see Jesus. Is that clear? So are we to understand Ellen White's statement about the lesser and greater light in the same context? You allow Ellen White to explain Ellen White. Now listen, little heed is given to the Bible. And the Lord has given a lesser light, that's the writings of Ellen White, to shine on what? On the Bible to lead men and women to what? To the greater light. And who is the greater light? Jesus Christ. The greater light is not Scripture. Scripture is a lesser light. The writings of Ellen White are a lesser light. But Ellen White was raised up to shine on the pages of the Bible that people have ignored, they don't understand, and when she shines on the Bible, say, Wow, I see Jesus there. Let's read this statement from Desire of Ages, page 220. The prophet John was the connecting link. See, we let Ellen White explain what lesser and greater light are, folks. The prophet John was the connecting link between the two dispensations. As God's representative, he stood forth to show the relationship of the law and the prophets to the Christian dispensation. See, he was to show the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Christian dispensation. Now notice, he was the lesser light which was to be followed by a greater. Who is the greater? Jesus. 
the Holy Spirit illuminated the mind of John that he might shed light upon his people. But no other light, see here you're going to find what the greater light is, but no other light ever has shone or ever will shine so clearly upon fallen man as that which emanated from the teaching and example of Jesus. Christ and His mission had been but dimly understood as typified in the shadowy sacrifices. See, in the Old Testament the sacrifices were shadowy <laughs> because they were a lesser light. The Old Testament sacrifices. So she says, Christ and His mission had been but dimly, dimly understood as typified in the shadowy sacrifices. Even John had not fully comprehended the future immortal life through the Savior. We have time to read one more quotation from Review and Herald, volume 41, number 17, April 8, 1873. Ellen White explains the religion of the Jews in consequence of their departure from God consisted mostly in ceremony. John was the lesser light, which was to be followed by a greater light. He was to shake the confidence of the people in their what? Traditions and call their sins to remembrance, and lead them to repentance, that they might be prepared to appreciate the work of Christ. He was the lesser light, so that they would appreciate Christ, the greater light. In Conflict and Courage, page 279, we find these words, It was not his, that is John's, privilege to be with Christ, and witness the manifestation of divine power attending the greater light. So in the writings of Ellen White, what is the greater light? The Scriptures? No. The greater light is Jesus Christ. Now we're going to read one more statement, and then we will continue our study of the greater and lesser light in our first session tomorrow morning. Have you understood what we've studied? Is there a remarkable parallel between the mission and ministry of John the Baptist and the mission and ministry of Ellen White? It's a striking parallel. We haven't uh, finished presenting the full parallel, but once we continue tomorrow, you're going to say, wow, this is simply amazing. And so, what is the role of Ellen White? The role of Ellen White is very simple, folks. It's not to give new light. It's not another Bible. Her writings are not of lesser authority than the Bible, less inspired than the Bible, the purpose of her writings is for her to shine on the Scriptures so that people can see in the Scriptures Jesus Christ. It's that simple, and that's the work of Ellen White. Visit SecretsUnsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary-level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.